invite you to take a seat where you are, but I'm going to ask Rob to come and read our reading this morning from Ruth chapter 3. So I invite you to follow along on the screen or uh, open a Bible that you may have with you. Thank you, Rob. I get, I get a bit concerned when the, I get up here and there's all bold people been before me, <laughs> except for Zoe, of course. <coughs> Will you turn with me to the book of Ruth and to chapter 3? One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you have showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of the town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true I am your guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, he, if he wants to, do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one of us know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring the shawl that you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed a bundle on her, and he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what has happened, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Father God, we pray for Zoe now as she brings to us your word, the thoughts that she's had over these past few days working through this passage. That, Father God, it will be a blessing to her. And most of all, Father, it will be a blessing to us that we will see you in this wonderful story. In your name. Amen. Thank you, Rob. So boldness rewarded, that is our theme this morning. And as we have been worshipping together 
and uh, as I was praying before the service this morning, I just feel the Lord is saying to us that we are to practice this theme of boldness this morning. And so it's, it's not in my nature, but I feel in some ways I need to adjust what I'm going to bring this morning so that we have space to respond to what God has to say. So I'm going to give you a summary of my thoughts on this passage this morning, allowing space that God would meet with us. Because there's one verse in this chapter that I think God is saying to us today. And it's this image at the end that Rob's just read to us that we've seen, that Boaz uh, gives to Ruth six bundles of barley and says to her, take it back to Naomi so that basically don't leave this place empty-handed. And I think that's what God is saying to us this morning, not to leave this place empty-handed. So we have to allow space and time for him to meet with us. But what do we see in our passage? I think we see five things this morning. I think we see hope is on the horizon. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And then I think we see these women uh, take bold, proactive steps towards hope. And this takes and requires such boldness, such vulnerability, such bravery to pursue the hope that is in front of them. And as they do, as they step out in faith, we see it's not the first time they've done this in the story. I'm hearing the calls of the decisive action that Ruth has made already to get us to this point. And then we see Boaz respond so honourably in a way that doesn't seek pleasure for himself, that honours Ruth. And then we see him say to them, don't leave this place empty-handed. He's giving them an assurance of his provision to come. And I think the Lord is asking us this morning to be bold, to be brave, to be pursuers of hope as we go after him. And that when we meet with him, simply... He provides us with grace and peace and a blessing. That means we are never leaving his presence empty-handed. So that's what I want us to see. We've sung this morning already the the words of the song. um, We're acknowledging that God is our guardian, that he goes before us, that he is beside us. And I think that's what we see in our passage. And when God says, trust and obey, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. That's what we're seeing at work. And my prayer this morning is that God would open up new opportunities for us as we pursue the hope and the future that he has for us, as we go after uh, his presence boldly uh, with this newfound bravery, knowing that we never leave his presence open-handed. Well, we enter it open-handed, but we never leave empty-handed. Essentially, at the end of Ruth chapter 2, where were we last week, we acknowledged that hope was on the horizon but it had not yet come to Ruth and Naomi. They were assured of this hope, but it was a potential hope uh, that needed action. Boaz was a possible kingsman redeemer. Naomi had identified this link between them and their, their family, but the narrator had told us much sooner of this link, but yet nothing has changed. We read at the end of Ruth chapter two, that Ruth Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz and gleaned until the barley and um, wheat harvest were finished. But at this moment, she was still living with her mother-in-law. So hope is rising, hope is stirring, but the circumstances haven't changed. Hope is identified in Boaz. He's a close relative. And we've spent some time over the last few weeks thinking about what this practice of a kingsman redeemer means where a close relative would step up to redeem and restore something that was lost, whether that's through the loss of life and a family member had passed away or the loss of land. um, It was their job to marry the widow with the aim of keeping the future generations going for the legacy in the land. We've explored Boaz's increasing kindness and generosity to this point, how he is an image of Christ to come, how He, um, Boaz, shows us that Christ, who became like us, was willing to redeem us, had the means to pay for our redemption in full. And through Boaz, Ruth has the potential of a hope and a future. And we see that with a life with Jesus gives us a hope and a future. 
So this potential hope is on the horizon as we start looking at Ruth chapter 3. We're on the cusp of something new again, a new season, but we're left asking the question, how is this going to come together? I don't know if you've experienced that in your life where you just go, I don't know how this is going to come together. But we're hearing the echoes of a previous call to action that Ruth and Naomi had, a decision when they needed to make, when Naomi is urging her daughters-in-law to stay put and to remarry. And to begin with, they both refused, but um, Lydia's really helped us think this through already. Orpah kisses Naomi goodbye and exits the story, but Ruth clings to her. That was a defining moment. Where are we going to go? And she says, I'm all in. I want your God to be my God, your people to be my people, and I will follow you. But here we are again at another crossroads. A plan is forming. This time it's not let's go back to Bethlehem. We need to go to Boaz. We need to be proactive ourselves. It's a time for decisive action. And I wonder this morning if that's a word for any of us too. It's time for decisive action. And here's the plan that Naomi is scheming. Tonight, Boaz will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. You need to go to him. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes and go to him. And in a way, this tells us of her intentions. Take off your grieving clothes and make yourself available to him. Uncover his feet and lie down with him. He will tell you what to do, Naomi says to her. It's an incredible incredibly vulnerable act. Naomi is saying to her daughter-in-law, go to him, and basically his life is going to be in his, well, your life is going to be in his hands. And she says, I'll do whatever you say, and goes in utter obedience. Essentially, it's the harvest supper, there's a feast going on, and a knees up, and Ruth is sent in on a mission. She goes proactively. What does this teach us? I think today we see that we cannot be passive in our faith journey. Faith requires action. So Ruth goes and and the text tells us she does everything that her mother-in-law tells us, tells her to do. And what are we thinking at this point? Maybe we've got thoughts circulating in our head and we could get distracted this morning and I don't believe that's where we're going, but we could start asking questions about what is being suggested in the passage. Are we supposed to read this like a David Attenborough documentary? Do you know what I mean? Where the camera angles show a mate and a potential suitor, one getting glammed up, one having a party, and you wonder where the story is going. Instead, I really, really think the text is telling us that what Ruth is doing here is unusual. It is different to the custom of the day in the sense that she is the one being proactive. She is the one writing herself into the story. Do you remember that from a few weeks ago? She is the one being, uh, working with partnership here with God. Her intentions are clear. She's asking Boaz to marry her, to be her kingsman redeemer. And we know that because the text shows us uh, the big question that Ruth asks Boaz. But the thing is, this is a vulnerable step. This is a brave step to take. Because do you remember as we've studied the story so far, how dangerous even the daytime was for Ruth? There was multiple occasions in the story where the narrator reminded us about the precarious position that she was in. How Boaz told his hired men not to touch her how she was to find refuge under the wings of God, his protection so far in the story. But this isn't daytime, this is nighttime. She is vulnerable. She could be taken advantage of. How would Boaz react? That's the big question that we have on our minds. He is a wealthy and powerful Israelite landowner. Would he see Ruth's attempt as like a vain attempt to climb the social ladder? Would he take advantage of her and call her an adulterer? Would he use the opportunity for his own pleasure, shaming her or charging her with prostitution or disqualifying her from marrying her potential kingsman redeemer? Boaz's reaction had big implications for Ruth and for Naomi. Ruth goes, he is startled and wakes up in the middle of the night and says to her, who are you? 
And Ruth replies humbly by saying, I am your servant. And then we see her go one step further, I think, that she's now not just following instructions from her mother-in-law, she is taking this into her own hands, I believe. She's kind of going off script and she's ad-libbing a little bit. Because Naomi says, do these actions and then he will tell you what to do. But what we read is that Ruth asks Boaz a question. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are my guardian redeemer of my family. And this is a delicate request for marriage. She is saying, I need your covering in my life. And in earlier parts of scripture, especially in Ezekiel, we use God use this language in a covenant relationship with his people, Jerusalem. And it says, how the Lord is walking past and is loving his people and he spreads the corner of his garment over them. That's a sign of marriage and a sign of covenant. Other translations of this question that she asked boldly suggest that spreading his garment over her is the same as spreading his wings over her. Essentially, we are seeing a full circle in our passage. Because before, Boaz spoke a blessing over Ruth, didn't he? I want you to find refuge under the wings of God. And now Ruth has come to him and is saying, you be the answer to your own prayer. Marry me, give my family protection and safety. And he does so in a way that acknowledges her worth. Daughter, bless you, is his response. He honours the fact that she's not gone elsewhere looking for younger men or richer men. And he sees the precarious, vulnerable position that she is in. How she is seeking to follow the law and find safety with him. He describes her noble character and assigns her worth. He reassures her and reveals, though, the one more condition that we read in our story. He goes, yes, I am a guardian redeemer for your family, but there is one closer than I. And then we go, okay, this is making sense. Why is Ruth the one who's being proactive here? And why is Boaz not pursuing her? There is one closer than him. But then we ask, who is this anonymous man? Why has he not acted yet? How is he, why has he not offered protection to Ruth and Naomi so far? But we see in the midst of all of this that hope is on the horizon. And I think we're getting closer to the sunset. Stay here for the night, Boaz says to Ruth. In the morning, if he wants to do his duty and redeem you, then good, let him. If not, if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. And then we see his actions uh, continue, his admirable actions. He doesn't want to shame Ruth. He says, you need to leave here without people seeing that you've been here. He's not trying to shame her or allow others to speculate. But then he says, do not go away empty-handed. Leave here knowing my intentions and go back to your mother-in-law, Naomi, with six measures of barley and says to her, show her this. I am not leaving you empty-handed. Hope is on the horizon and it's getting closer. Don't leave here empty what a beautiful, redemptive, full circle we are seeing again. Because Naomi, at the end of Ruth chapter 1, told us how she was empty. And Boaz is saying, go back to your mother-in-law so she knows that she is not empty-handed. She was bitter, she was bereaved, and said that she left Bethlehem to Moab full, but the Lord Almighty brought her back empty. Here we see the Lord refilling her hope again through Boaz. And I think that's an image that we need to ponder. God is saying to us this morning, I believe, do not leave this place empty-handed. I want to restore and refill you of your hope. And I was reminded as I've been praying for this morning, this week, of those verses in Joel that talk about restoring the years that the locusts have eaten. And I believe the Lord wants to do that this morning and offer um, an opportunity to encounter him so that our hope would be renewed and restored because he doesn't want us to leave this place empty-handed. 
And how can I say that with such confidence? I just want to return to those verses in Hebrew that we started with this morning. We can have boldness. Our faith is supposed to be proactive. It's supposed to lead us to um, unknown places. And it's, it's supposed to give us confidence because of what Jesus has done for us. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Don't we see Ruth go with confidence? Don't we see Boaz respond with grace and mercy? We can boldly approach God, and when we do, we never leave empty-handed. That's what I want you to hear this morning. God's hands are full of grace and mercy for us in our time of need. And it's not just a thought, because we, again, we see this embodied all over Scripture, all over the Gospels. How does Jesus meet with people? I was reminded of the sinful woman who came to Jesus boldly yet vulnerably. And Jesus is reclining at the Pharisee's house, and her reputation is known to people, but she came anyway. And she came boldly because she wasn't invited, and people were staring and people were looking, but Jesus welcomed her. And she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, an expensive expense, and she wept all over Jesus' feet and began to wipe his feet with her, her hair and her tears. And she kisses him and she pours perfume all over him. Regardless of what people thought, she came boldly in worship. She came empty, and I think she emptied herself of everything. But boy, did she not leave empty-handed. Jesus sent her on a w her way with a, his blessing. He said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. She came empty and ashamed and she left whole. Never to be empty-handed again as Jesus sent her on her way with his peace. Today, my message is simple. I believe God wants us to be proactive in our faith. I believe he wants us to be pursuers of hope. I believe he wants us to live in a way that empties ourselves of us and encounters him in worship. And we can do that confidently and boldly, knowing that when we encounter him, we find the mercy and grace we need. We never leave empty-handed. So I ask you this morning, where is the Lord asking you to take a step of bravery? Where is he asking you to be bold? How can he restore to you the hope that you might have lost? Because I believe he wants to this morning restore to us maybe the joy of our salvation, restore to us hope. And he doesn't want us to leave this place empty-handed. Our declaration this morning is that our bravery comes from him. It's not a reckless bravery. The spirit of the Lord does not make us timid. So my prayer this morning is that the Holy Spirit instead would bring his power, his love, and his self-control. Because Boaz's response was one of control, one of self-control. Yet we are to be followers that aren't in control. We follow God wherever it is that he is calling us to go. So I want to invite the band to come up this morning and I'd love to pray for us and just to have some space now to receive ministry if that's, if that's helpful. Because again, I believe the Lord is saying to us, do not leave this place empty handed. So I'm going to invite you to stand and the band are going to lead us in a song called Waymaker. Because... Um, the Lord, I believe, wants to make a way where we sometimes believe there is no way. And he wants to restore to us hope this morning in him. So shall we pray? Shall we stand? Shall we be ready to receive whatever the Lord has for us? And the prayer team will be here, like I said, to offer prayer this morning to anybody who would appreciate prayer. Who anybody who this is resonated with. 
And whether it's helpful, you might want to open your hands out, because at the moment they're empty, but I believe the Lord wants to gift us his presence, gift us his encouragement. But shall we pray? Jesus, we want to worship you this morning. I believe, Lord, that you are here working in this place. And I thank you that you don't want us to leave empty-handed. Lord, we believe you are the way maker. When we don't see the way that hope might appear, we, we know the God who opens up new possibilities. And I believe, Lord, you are calling us to be brave for you. Our declaration today is that we are here, Lord, to worship you. In death and in life, we are confident and covered by the power of your great love. Would we receive that truth this morning? Release your power upon your church, I pray, so that we wouldn't leave this place empty-handed. Restore to us, Lord, hope. Would hope arise in this place? Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Lord, would you build our hope as we worship you now? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.